The views expressed on this broadcast of Speaker Monday with your host, the Monty Man, do not necessarily reflect the opinions of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting or its affiliates. KHLT is not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. Just when you think you have all your ducks in a row, life takes a spin. It happens again and again. It seems to me that when I take my will and let you go without a pose, I've been living that fact. Stay out of my own way Welcome to Speaker Monday with the Monty Man. Each week, Monty brings us speakers from a variety of 12-step fellowships. Now here's the Monty Man with this week's speaker. Well, greetings, family. Welcome to another episode of Speaker Monday here at Take12Radio.com on your internet dial. And uh, it is absolutely amazing to me uh, how blessed we are here at Take 12 Radio to have you as our listening audience. This week's speaker is Chris S. And uh, he is absolutely one of our favorite uh, uh, AA Circuit speakers. Chris is also the uh, chairman of the board of directors here at Take 12 Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. Uh, Chris is going to be speaking uh, on the topic of the problem and the solution, recovery from alcoholism. You do not want to miss this. But first, let's hear from our sponsor for this show. Men, women, and their families experience tremendous pain and suffering due to the struggles they face from substance abuse and its co-occurring mental health challenges. They need to find a safe place for peace and healing. Therapia Addiction Healing Center was born out of a deep desire to provide that safe and powerful healing environment. Therapia exists to help people recover from addictions by developing and maintaining healthy, meaningful relationships with God, self, and others. To speak with an addiction specialist, call 1-855-652-4325. That's 1-855-652-4325. Or visit our website at www.therapia.net. Therapia Addiction Healing Center. Restoring lives one step at a time. All right, and welcome back. And without further ado, here is Chris S. on the problem and the solution, recovery from alcoholism. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. I would like to start this morning's session off with a couple of readings from uh, conference-approved literature. This is actually, uh, these, these uh, quotations are actually written by Bill Wilson. This one is from the pamphlet, Problems Other Than Alcohol. It says, sobriety, freedom from alcohol through the teaching and practice of the 12 steps is the sole purpose of an AA group. You wouldn't have known that with some of the groups I went to early on. Um, here's one. Here's one from page 174. This is from Tradition Nine in the uh, in the Step Book. It says, "Unless each AA member follows to the best of his ability our suggested 12 steps to recovery, he almost certainly signs his own death warrant. His drunkenness and disillusion are not penalties inflicted by people in authority. They result from his personal disobedience." to spiritual principles. And one of my favorite quotations ever comes from the forward to the 12 and 12. It says, AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which, if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. I think those three, uh, those three quotations 
kind of highlight the importance of the 12 steps or the recovery process that we get exposed to or not exposed to in Alcoholics Anonymous. Back in the early days of AA, uh, they had a really high success rate for people who came in and bought into uh, the AA process. About 50% of them sobered up and stayed that way. Another 25% had a few relapses, realized that, that this stuff was serious and came back and, uh, you know, and did the deal and they stayed sober. And then it says 25% showed improvement. I believe that to mean that there was probably uh, long periods of sobriety with, uh, with some continued relapse, but that still is a 75% recovery rate for early AA. Uh, I don't have to tell you that our recovery rate today is pretty low for people who come into AA and are serious about not drinking. Uh, at a guess, I would say it's somewhere around 10%. So there's something that's going on in, in contemporary AA today that is uh, obviously not as, uh, as, as good as early AA. My personal, uh, my personal belief is... Uh, is that in the early days, you were brought into the recovery process very, very quickly. Your sponsors were uh, rather insistent on you going through the 12 steps because that really was the Alcoholics Anonymous process back then. The meetings were fewer and further between. And after you bought into the recovery process and started to work the spiritual principles and spiritual exercises, uh, you were welcomed into the fellowship. Today, you're, you're welcomed into the fellowship and you're allowed to go to the back of the room uh, and not be held accountable to working a recovery process. You're allowed to languish day after month after year uh, not working a program of recovery and suffering. And again, some of the things we talked about last night is you don't know what you don't know. So if you've never experienced recovery, it's hard to understand that it's out there. You kind of have to take it on faith. Uh, the, the, uh, the quotations that I just read uh, let us know that it is our responsibility. It is our responsibility to let people know, to educate them about the steps through the teaching and practice of the 12 steps. That's the sole purpose of an AA group. So if your group is not engaged in that, uh, do something to help. You know, do something to help. What, what, what we did in, uh, in Burnsville is we started some step work groups. Uh, they started off in people's homes and ended up becoming meetings. Uh, and that was, uh, that was a way for us, to, uh, us to, to teach and practice the 12 steps in our fellowship area. Very, very important. Um, speaking on the first step, I'll tell you this right now. The first step is, is the most misunderstood step in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have bumped into people with 20 years who don't have a clue what the first step is or what the first step really means. You'll hear something like, well, I always, you know, I, I, I always practice the first step. I just don't drink no matter what. That goes so at odds with, with the, the understanding of the 12 steps of the, of step one. Step one basically is I have a mind that will convince me to put alcohol back in my body. Even though I know it's a bad idea, I know the consequences are grievous. Uh, I know I'll lose my job. I know I'll lose my family. I know I'll lose my driver's license. And I know I'll probably be in a six-month blackout bender you know, and end up in jail. Uh, even knowing all that, I have a mind that will force me to put liquor back in my body. And then I have a body that will force me to continue to drink it because of the, the physical craving. Uh, the physical craving will have me in its grip for who knows how long. I have no control over how long that lasts. Uh, I don't separate from alcohol. There, there are uh, periodic drinkers uh, probably in the room. I'm not a periodic drinker. I'm a daily blackout drinker. Uh, I need to have, when I'm, when I'm hooked in, I need to have a certain amount of alcohol every single day or I go into uh, serious withdrawal symptoms. So, uh, so I've got a body that's going to force me to drink so much, I'm going to poison myself, ruin all my organs, and probably die within two or three years at best if I pick back up. 
and then there's a dash after powerless over alcohol that our lives had become unmanageable. And that's really misunderstood because so many people think that that means the external unmanageability, the crashing of the cars, you know, the projectile vomiting, the getting slapped by women, all those fun things that happen to us, you know, as uh, as active alcoholics, uh, <clears throat> because we're so appropriate when we're really drunk, right? That's really that's really only a small part of. Uh, of the unmanageability. The unmanageability is really an internal condition. And uh, I want to I want to start this morning uh, speaking uh, to you all about my experience with this and uh, what it was like and what happened uh, and what it's like now as as it concerns uh, the first three steps. One of the earliest memories I have as a, as a child, is being dragged off to kindergarten, okay? I hadn't gotten out a lot much uh, by this time, so I didn't have a lot of experience out there uh, mixing it up with all my peers. My mother puts me in the car, drives me up, up, uh, up into town, across town, over to the kindergarten uh, uh, classroom, opens the door, and says, there's the kindergarten room right down there. And it was down a hill. And I'll, I can remember this like it was yesterday. I was standing up on top of the hill looking down. And all these kids are playing. They're, they're playing tag. They're running around. They're, there's a kickball game going on. They've all been friends for 35 years. Okay? I'm standing up on the hill. I'm feeling like a jerk. I'm like, I've got this self-centered fear. Like, I can't go down there. You know, what if they don't like me? What if I do something stupid? You know, what if I get ostracized? So I'm like this, this, uh, I'm filled with this self-centered fear standing up there. And that's my first recollection is acting as if everything is okay. That's another thing that I heard when I, when I came into AA. Everybody was telling me to act as if. I'd been doing that my whole life. I wanted to quit acting as if. I wanted to if. You know what I mean? So, uh, so anyway, here I am, uh, here I am, uh, I'm, I'm integrating with my peers. I got to tell you, I'm, I'll be honest with you about this. Uh, that traumatic kindergarten experience would have been fine if I would have had a half a pint of whiskey, you know, but the problem was they weren't serving five-year-olds back then. Uh, that was really my problem because from, Age five until about age 12, I had to act as if I was not falling apart inside. You know, there would be like oral book reports that I would have to give. I would cut school for like not just the day I had to give the oral report, but for five days afterward, just in case there was like a makeup oral report. I wanted them to forget all about me going up in front of the class to give an oral report. I mean, I was like, I, I was like traumatized. So I developed this fight or flight uh, mentality. You know, I would, I would, uh, I would lose, lose my mind, or I would disappear. Those were my my skill sets uh, back back then, in between in between uh, ages five to twelve. So <clears throat> here I am, just getting by in school. I mean, I, I I learned how to how to act cool, but I but I wasn't. You know, uh, time comes. It's I'm about twelve years old. Uh, I'm hanging out with two of my friends, and we make a decision to go back to my house, cut school, go back to my house, get a bottle of whiskey down out of the closet, and get drunk. Now, none of us have been drunk before, but it sounded like a cool idea. You know, like, let's go steal a car, or, you know, you know whatever you, you come up with as, as a kid. Uh, so we go back to my mother's house. We cut school. I don't know anything about drinking back then. Uh, I don't come from an alcoholic household. Uh, I, uh, I sympathize for anybody that was in, in that, that monstrously dysfunctional uh, uh, life mode if you uh, come from an alcoholic uh, household. Uh, I had to blow the dust off of this whiskey bottle. I'll never forget. It was Four Roses Canadian Whiskey, which after this experience, I could never even smell without getting violently ill. Anyway... Um, I had watched some John Wayne movies, and he kind of showed me how to drink. You ever see John Wayne, like, blow into the saloon? He'd, you know, knock the saloon doors back, go up to the, go, bartender, whiskey! 
and the bartender would grab a bottle and fill up a big water glass, and John would grab the water glass, chug it down, grab the bottle, and go back to his table to play cards or whatever. You know, So that's how you drink. So I take this bottle of Four Roses Canadian whiskey, which you do not drink warm out of a water glass. If, if you know anything about drinking, you, you know, you have to mix it, put it on ice, let it breathe at least, you know. I just, I just poured out these three water glasses and handed them out. And here's what happened to the two other guys who never became alcoholics, never became hard drinkers. They drank about two thirds of their glass and they'd had enough. You ever drink with people that have enough? No, thanks. I've had enough. I've got to go home to the little lady. What? Let's go to the city, you know? Are you crazy? We're just getting started here. So anyway, that's what they did. They drank two-thirds of their glass, and they'd had enough, and then they watched the show, okay? Because I didn't stop there. I drank three glasses of this stuff, went into a, a, a blackout, trashed the house, and woke up in a field. So those guys got, those guys got a drink and a show, let me tell you. Uh, I come to in this field, and I don't know how I got there, and this is my first experience with blackouts, which is, anybody in here ever have blackouts? You know what I'm talking about, right? You, that's disconcerting, isn't it? You lose all that, that big block of time. You know, you can travel in a blackout and you wake up in Topeka with one shoe and you, you gotta, you gotta pretend you wanted to be there because you gotta look cool, right? You know, I always go to Topeka on Thursday nights. Wondering what the hell you're doing. So anyway, I had a blackout. So here I am. Here I am, uh, a 12 year old who can qualify for Alcoholics Anonymous. Right then and there, I could have, I could have walked in and I could have qualified. I gotta tell you, because here's the more significant thing. Yes, the, the physical craving took over and one drink asked for the second. The second drink insisted on the third. The third drink demanded the fourth. That's the phenomenon of craving and that's how it manifested in me at 12 years old. So, and I drank for another 20 years. That, that was really something, as you can imagine. Anyway, um, uh, here's what happened to that scared kindergartner that I told you about earlier, the, 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 per, the, the kid with all that self-centered fear and anxiety and just, just completely uncomfortable with himself and any environment he was in. The whiskey took that away. The whiskey changed my whole attitude and my whole outlook on life. I have got to tell you, all of a sudden, I was larger than life. All of a sudden, I felt uh, the strength and the confidence to be and do the things I always wanted to be and do without that repressed fear. And then I went into a blackout and trashed the house. But here's what happened. I, I was a violent, violent hangover, the kind where you can't get off the horizontal plane for a couple of days. And I was ill. But slowly the memory of how ill I was started to disappear and the memory of how alcohol changed the way I felt about myself, I, I, I did not forget that. That was like the anti, anti Chris fear medication I'd been looking for forever. I thought that that's what was going to allow me to be like you. Because I could not, I couldn't have understood that you had the same type of repressed anxiety that I had. I just wouldn't have believed it. So, so all of a sudden, I'm 12 years old, and I start to become preoccupied with alcohol. I start to think about where am I going to get it. Now, I'm certainly not going to drink Four Roses whiskey anymore, but people tell me that beer or wine, you know, or Mad Dog 2020 or Boone's Farm Apple Wine, you know, might be a better way to go. You know, some of the more experienced 12-year-old drinkers that I was <laughs> that I was hanging out with. Uh, so I started to experiment. Now, the drinking age was 21 at this time. So that, that you know, posed some, uh, some uh, logistical difficulties. But, you know, an enterprising uh, young kid like myself uh, was able to get past that. We found reprobates that would, uh, would buy us booze. And so, uh, so anyway, here we are. Here I am uh, looking forward to the weekend because I would plan out the drinking. Uh, I would figure out who I was going to drink with. There's the parties were starting right around this time. You remember the high school parties and things like that, where there'd be a keg or whatever, you know. So 
more and more I got preoccupied with alcohol and less and less I got preoccupied with things like school. Um, I come from a very, very smart family. Uh, my brother and sister are both Phi Beta Kappa college professors. My mother and fa- father were both Phi, pa- Phi Beta Kappa masters plus 30 educators. I mean, very, very intelligent. My, my brother went to Caltech. You know, my, my sister went to Mount Holyoke. It's just a ridiculously intelligent family. Uh, none of them have any common sense, but uh, but they've got uh, they've got the PhD. My PhD was in pretty heavy drinking. Anyway, uh, anyway, I I you know I'm more and more I'm occupied I'm preoccupied with the alcohol and I'm drinking more and more and I'm letting uh, letting things like academic life go. Now I did not catch myself and say, oh my God, I've I've become preoccupied with alcohol. Uh, this is, seems to be affecting my grades. If I allow this to continue, I may not get into the college of my choice. Do you think I said that? No. I, sa- I said the war cry of every alcoholic. Who cares? And I graduated the second stupidest kid in my high school class. I did. The guy who beat me out couldn't read or write. This is like, it's like a D minus minus minus. So, uh, so anyway, you know, and the, and the whole time it's escalating. You know, my, my drinking really is escalating. And uh, I come from a period of time uh, where uh, it was the early 70s when I was really starting to drink. And there was a lot of the non-conference approved uh, substances out there uh, that were available to, to kids like me. And uh, I partook of them. Uh, I didn't almost didn't care what they were. I, some of the some of the ODs I had is I I OD'd on on some kid's father's heart medication one time. Maybe I you know, I'd take anything. It was a, it was insane. Um, uh, I remember the the Quaalude epidemic of 1972, where my buddy comes into school with a big sack of Roar 714s that he got from his brother the night before, a sack of them. And he hadn't done them. No one had done these at, the, at this period of time. And he comes out to the smoking area at first period, and he lays them down, and uh, he starts selling them to all of us. Uh, you know, about a half, half of the school is, are, are uh, drug addicts at this point in time. You know, uh, so we're buying them. They're a dollar a piece. And uh, we go, well, how many do you take? He goes, oh, two or three. <laughs> if you know anything about quaaludes, Eating like three quaaludes, you are limber. Let me just put it that way, okay? You know, you're not feeling any pain. It's first period. And, and uh, so so the ambulance was in and out all day long. I mean, I heard people passing out in front of the principal. The cops were looking for the qualud dealers, like, for the next five years after that. And, and so, and, uh, you know, the, the LSD, that was that was always great. Uh I remember, I remember this, this one time I, I bought some LSD down at the park and I knew enough to know that you, you take it and you've got about 45 minutes to a half an hour before you need to get in a safe place, like a controlled environment, okay? So I take it at this park and I'm driving up to get the, get the beer at the liquor store and I, 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 I see a friend of mine in front of me in a car and he doesn't see me, right? So I give him like one of those love taps, you know, you kind of ram into him in the back at like about two miles an hour just to get their attention. And he, you know, he goes like this, he turns around, he sees me and we both wave. Well, he, he's got, he's got a, a drill, a, a drill sergeant father at home who inspects the car every single time he brings it home. So I'm at home with the headphones on listening to Led Zeppelin just visualizing you can imagine it was like Disney World and the phone rings it's the police department they want me down there right away to fill out an accident report so I have to go down to the to the police department tripping my brains out I remember like walking up to the place like the the doors were like 30 feet high you know and 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 I go in, and the bright fluorescent lights, you know, and the desk is like way up here. And I go, I go, you're short of the accident report. Right? And a cop looks at me, he's a big cop. I can see all the moles on his face. It's like really scary. And uh, he, puts, he puts down a piece of paper. He goes, okay, draw the intersection where this alleged accident took place. And he hands me a pencil. And I start drawing, and I'm drawing this tiny little thing like the size of a postage stamp. And he looks down at me and goes, no! And he 
he grabs the paper away from me and he starts ripping it up. And then he start, then he takes another piece of paper out and he knows he has an intersection. So he starts drawing this big intersection. I'm like, no, that intersection's too big. I'm like, it was just, you know, one scene after another. And, uh, I gotta tell, I gotta tell you, alcohol, I needed, I needed alcohol to get through everything. Even my, even my drug ingestion, I, I needed, I needed alcohol because that, that sometimes could be traumatic. Uh, so they, they talk about in our book, they talk about crossing a line, crossing a line. And, and, uh, unfortunately we cross the line before we decide seriously to quit drinking. You know, that's really not a great thing. Uh, uh, the, you cross the line many times before you're even going to make a serious attempt to quit. So I went from becoming preoccupied with alcohol to becoming obsessed with alcohol to moving into the mental obsession. And here's how, here's how it manifested. I'm out of high school now. I graduated the second stupidest kid. And I took a year off. You know, uh, because I needed the space or something, you know, the, all the, I, and, uh, I'm hanging out and I'm going to the high school party still, but it's like a class down because all of, all the people in my class have graduated and gone to college. They're, they've got jobs. Some of them are even getting married and settling down. And it's like they don't want to drink around the clock anymore. So I've got to move down the scale to the younger crowd. And, and after a while, it starts getting uncomfortable going to the high school parties when you're like seven years older than the, <laughs> the, than the kids, you know, it starts to become an issue. So I start hanging out with lower and lower common denominator people. And seriously, the last people I ended up drinking with didn't really even have names. They were, they were a green man and Weezer and one guy's name was Rat, you know, uh, and uh, so... I mean, it, it, it really is not working. And the crazy thing is, the crazy thing is, is I'm a smart guy. I mean, I really am. I'm I, not, my grades don't show it, <laughs> but, but I, I'm, I'm an, I'm an intelligent individual and I'm doing these, this stupid thing. I'm allowing my life to slip out of my hands. I'm caught up in alcoholism. I'm caught up in the unmanageability of, of life. And, uh, this goes on and on and on. Uh, I'm, I'm drinking more and more and more and I'm starting to lose things. Uh, I, I totaled nine cars and drunken blackouts. I got three DWIs. Uh, I lost a family, you know, my family, uh, uh, a wife and a child. Uh, they took off because they just, they couldn't put up with it because I'm caught in the progression. And you, you could ask me, you know, do you love your family? I love my family as much as I love anything in the world. Well, would you quit drinking? I don't understand the question. You know, how do those two even go together? You know, I mean, it, it's true. The, the alcoholic is truly a, a bizarrely incapable of of seeing the truth uh, in step one, and seeing the truth of the nature of their alcoholism and the amount of trouble it's causing them. We, you know, we don't understand the question. So for 20 years, I'm drinking alcoholically and, you know, the milkman would have known that it's a bad idea for me to drink. And I ended up, uh, I ended up in a room in my mother's house toward the end of my drinking. She just didn't have the, the wherewithal to throw me out in the street. I, I certainly would have been, uh, been homeless or, or in a welfare hotel or something because that's how, that's how bad it had gotten. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm in my mother's house and I'm drinking and it finally gets to the point where, I'm recognizing that I have to separate from alcohol. I mean, I knew it in the back of my mind, but now it's in the front of my mind because uh, I'm, I'm starting to lose my mind. I'm at work one day. I became an electrician somehow. Don't, don't ask me how. Probably because the trades are a great place to hide if you're an alcoholic because they don't care if you're green and your eyes are yellow. As long as you, you know, accomplish your work, that's fine. You know, they don't care what you look like. And so, so I, I found an alcoholic boss to work for. You know, we're great at that. And uh, I, was, I was an electrician. And I remember this one day. This is how much faith they had in me as an electrician. Uh, the, my boss was a, uh, my, the person who was the foreman was a kid. A 19-year-old kid was in charge of me. I was 32. <laughs> I was like, what do you want me to do next, junior? You know, it was like. 
It's like humiliating. But you, you listen. You, you wouldn't have put me. You wouldn't have put me in charge of managing a lemonade stand at, at that point in time. I was just. I was too. I was too bad. I mean, some of the mistakes I made as an electrician. I remember drilling down into one guy's closet by mistake, and you know, I had him open up the door because the drill was stuck. And he's got, there's a line of suits covered with plaster and one of them's curled up into the ceiling where where my drill bit caught it you know and had to he goes what are you gonna do about this i go oh you know a good martinizer (laughs) you know i don't know what do you want me to do uh another time i i mistakenly wired uh a brand new kitchen addition to a timer meter uh and the t- the kitchen came on at eight o'clock at night and went off at six o'clock in the morning and the people had moved in. They're like, Listen, this is unacceptable. We eat at six, you know? And, and so I was I was a bad electrician, but you know the So the last the last thing that happened, the last thing that happened that that that, that was the straw that grew you know, it's always the straw that breaks the camel's back. I mean sometimes it's not even our worst drunk. That gets our attention. But here I was, I was trying to put a screw, a ground screw in a ceiling fixture box. And you have to put the screw on the end of the screwdriver and, and find the hole. And, and I, I, I drank like a quart of whiskey the night before. I'm, I'm like shaking. I'm dropping the screw. I'm shaking. I got to get down off the ladder and find the screw. Get there, shake, drop the screw down off the ladder. And Junior is looking at me. You know what I mean? He's looking at me like, you pathetic, good for nothing, no account loser. Yeah, because alcoholics can can hear people thinking at them, you know. When you're in, a, I know what you're thinking, and and I just couldn't take that. So I called up, uh, I called up uh, our version of Happy Hills, dialed them up, and I said, "I'm coming in." You know, I got drunk that night. I'm coming in, and I, I go into a 28 day program. I knew about this program because having to get my license back for one of my DWIs, I had to do outpatient. So outpatients here and inpatients up there. So I, I knew where it was, and, and I knew I couldn't make the decision to stop drinking and stop drinking. Okay, I knew that. I had come to terms with that. How many of us in here have made serious decisions to stop drinking and then changed your mind mysteriously? You know? I mean, that's that's the first step. You know what I mean? It's the, well, Our ego wants us to think that we're in control of decisions like that. We're not. If you're an alcoholic, you're not in, a control, in control of those decisions. Alcohol is or God is. Anyway, I sign myself in. I do the 28 days in, in the rehab. Now, there's some people that have had good experiences with uh, with rehab facilities. Uh, God bless you. You've gone to some good places. I, you know, I don't remember. I remember hardly anything of my rehab experience except sitting around in group. You ever do group? You sit in a big circle and you talk about your stuff. If you get a chance to, if somebody else isn't talking about their stuff, you know, and talking about their stuff for 20 minutes, you know, shut up so I can, it's going to be my turn. I want to talk about my stuff. You know, why don't you just go drink, you know? And that was my experience with, with group. There was, there was this one guy, Doug, who used to monopolize group and he'd talk about being thrown out of his house and then there's a restraining orders and he can't go in the same, on the block area around his house and he's going to jump in front of a bus. He's going to jump in front of a bus. He's constantly talking about jumping in front of a bus. I went down to the nurse's office to try to get some bus schedules for this guy. You know, I did. I swear I did. This is Mr. Recovery. I couldn't take, I couldn't take group. Where, where does group come from? I, I don't know. I mean, anyway, it, 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 so I, I get out of the 28 day program. Uh, I get the, the $12,000 big book and the pat on the butt to AA and off I go, uh, to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, you have to understand, I'm serious about this separation from alcohol stuff. I am oh so serious about staying away from booze. I've made a decision. As a matter of fact, I called up all my family and friends and whatever ones I had left, the uh, green man, and and, uh, <laughs> and I told my boss, I go, I'm done drinking. I'm in, I'm gonna I'm going to A and A. I'm gonna be one of the A and A's. And I just tell everybody, like I spread it all around. And uh, if you're new, don't do that. Anyway, so. Uh, 
So here's what happened. I go, I go to AA. Now, uh, now, again, I can't emphasize this enough. I am serious about not drinking. There's nothing in my life I want to do more than to not drink. And I, so I start going to AA. I'm going to two AA meetings a week, and I'm going back to inpa- outpatient. I'm paying $35 a session to listen, listen to the same mutton heads, do the same group thing. I mean, this is how, this is how serious I am about recovery. I'm paying to be tortured. So you got to understand I'm serious about it. So I'm going back to outpatient. I'm going to these AA meetings. And they're telling me to do certain things. There were fellowship suggestions. And I'm all for the fellowship suggestions that makes it uh, a more comfortable transition into the recovery process. And some of those are get a sponsor. And I'm thinking, well, a sponsor, you know, I'm looking around the room at the, 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 the choices here. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm smarter than all these people, I'm sure, you know, just listen to what they've got to say here. And, uh, you know, so I'll tell you what, I, I, I don't think I need to get uh, uh, somebody dumber than me to advise me. So I'll skip on the sponsor stuff. Thank you. Then they say get a home group. And the two, group, two AA meetings I was going to were autonomous. They weren't home group. You know, they didn't celebrate. You didn't get active. They were, you know, uh, uh, status quo meetings, you know, you, you maintenance meetings uh, for, for people who've been sober a long period of time. There was, there was no action in those meetings. And I thought, well, these are the meetings at the top of my street that I go to. Uh, I guess I can't get a home group unless one of these meetings turns into a home group on me. And every single serious suggestion, that's basically what, uh, what I did. I outthought the fellowship suggestions. Uh, and one day I'm on the way to an AA meeting and the thought crosses my mind. Now you gotta understand, there's not a person in those AA meetings that wants to not drink more than me. Here's what, here's, here's what the obsession of the mind can do. The thought crosses my mind that I haven't been doing a really good job with this AA stuff. And you know what? I can't even really remember what it's like to be drunk. I, you know, I haven't had, I haven't had a drink in almost three months now. I, and somebody in the meeting said, if you can't remember your last drink, you haven't had it. I, I, you know, I, uh, I know what I'll do. I'll buy a gallon of vodka. I'll take it back to my house. I'll drink it. And that will solve two things. I'll remember what it's like to be drunk. I'll feel so, so terrible. I'll rush back to AA and I'll really engage. Uh, I'll really engage in this Alcoholics Anonymous stuff. So that's what I did. I bought a gallon of vodka. I took it back to my house and I started drinking it. I start, I got a gallon of vodka to improve my sobriety. <laughs> the obsession of the mind doesn't care whether you don't want to drink. It'll do whatever it needs to do. Cunning, baffling, powerful. Yeah. You know, so here I am. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm drinking. I'm, I'm three drinks in. You know, where that big change occurs, you can feel the alcohol going through your bloodstream and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I mean, you know, you're, you're a different guy, you know, like up until, up until that point, you're sitting in a bar and you're too afraid to go ask the women for a date or whatever. And that, that, that change goes through you. Now you go up to any of them. And if they say no, you'll, well, that's, you know, you'll be sorry later. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like that whole change, you know, and, uh. I, I was listening to this one, uh, this one relationship workshop, nothing to do with, uh, with AA. And this one woman says, uh, there are two types of men that will approach a woman who hasn't given a single signal. One of them is, one of them is, is a mentally ill person and the other is a drunk. You know, <laughs> that's absolutely, probably absolutely true. Uh, anyway, so I'm sitting there, I'm drinking, I'm drinking this stuff and the, and the, the all of a sudden, it, it crosses my, it occurs to me the enormity of the mistake I just made. I realize, oh my God, I have just opened up the cage door to the beast and he's going to drag me around like a rag doll for however long, you know, I, I don't know when this is going to stop. I don't know what's going on. This is, uh, what am I, how stupid could I be? Oh my God, uh, I need more ice. You know? <laughs> And, uh, and this is what, this is what, I'm, now let me ask you this. They, they talk about in the second step, return to sanity. That, that would mean that there's a type, at least a type of insanity that they're talking about, right? 
Well, we're strangely insane where it concerns alcohol. We have no choice in drink. We don't know the truth from the false. Now, I didn't know the truth from the false. I just couldn't, I, I couldn't bring it into my consciousness, the truth from the false, prior to that drink. Now, let me ask you this. Was I insane before or after I started drinking? Before. The, the alcohol returned me to sanity. But by that time, it was too late because I was always, already caught up in the physical craving. The allergy of the body. Now, uh, this was this was really bad. Cause, uh, you know, I tried going back to AA, but uh, when you start a spiritual process that requires rigorous honesty with a lie and don't tell them you're you know you drank, that that usually sabotages the whole thing. So I made a couple of stabs at going back to the meetings, uh, and I just went out on a full blown relapse, and it it really got ugly. It culminated in uh, Christmas at the Schroeders, nineteen eighty nine. And my brother was there, my sister was there, nieces, nephews, cats. You know, the whole, the whole crew was at my mother's house for Christmas. And I start drinking and I go into a, a, a violent uh, blackout and I threaten all their lives. And, uh, you know, this wasn't really the festive type of mood everybody was looking for over Christmas, as you can imagine. So they picked up their Christmas and they moved it elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, I come out of a blackout sometime in between Christmas and New Year's, and I walk into the kitchen, and there's a pile of vodka bottles in the sink. I'm telling you, uh, two feet high. I can't. I used to buy one bottle at a time because I might quit tomorrow. You know, you ever do that? You ever buy like one pack of cigarettes at a time because you're going to quit tomorrow? Well, I must have walked up the street and back 12 or 15 times buying these bottles. It must have been a sight in a blackout. Um, I start to go into the DTs, which um, – 15% of alcoholics drink to the point where they suffer from DTs. 15% of the alcoholics who's ever had them have died from them. Uh, they're very, very serious. Most of the times you pop an aorta uh, like, like a burst garden hose, and your warranty is voided right then and there. Uh, uh, I start going into the DTs, and I start hallucinating, and there's animals running around the room, and there's big animals scratching on the house trying to get in and there's maggots on the slip covers and there's there's bands playing in my head and uh, a, a demon came out of the ceiling to eat my face and all this fun stuff and um but i didn't want to look stupid calling an ambulance or going to a hospital you know i'm probably gonna die but i don't want to look like a loser so i detoxed myself on the floor of the house where everybody had gone to have christmas somewhere else now when I got out of that, I had a willingness born of desperation, just born of desperation. I got to tell you, I couldn't exist one more minute like that. It was absolute torture. The hideous four horsemen, uh, terror and, and, and despair were all over me. Um, and, and I wished for the end. I remember the first prayer I had prayed besides, please don't let them pull me over. Uh, if, if you, if you keep them from pulling me over, I'll go back to church. You know, that, that prayer. Uh, the first prayer I had prayed since then was, uh, God, please let me get sober or kill me. I, I, I can't, I can't exist like this. I can't suffer like this anymore. And, uh, from, from that moment, uh, until today, uh, it's been a little. It's been a little over 16 years. I haven't had. Uh, I haven't had a drink of alcohol, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about what I learned about the first step, because I learned mostly about the first step in recovery, not even in the fellowship, but in recovery. Um, no one wants to admit. It says here in the step book, uh, "Who among us wants to admit complete defeat?" Who among us wants to admit that we have zero to do with whether we put alcohol back in our bodies or not? That's a real tough concept to get grips with. Who among us wants to admit that unless an act of divine providence, unless God manifests himself in us and through us, we will drink again? That's not the best prognosis, especially after you paid $13,000. For rehab, you know, well, uh, no human power could relieve you of your alcoholism, but God couldn't would uh, if he were sought. Here's your bill. 
I mean, who wants to know? I mean, we're, 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 we're damn near taught different in AA when somebody says, I just don't drink today. You know, you just have to remember not to drink today. Well, that, that presupposes you have the ability to do that, doesn't it? And a complete understanding of the first step is you don't have power of choice. You lack the power of choice in drink. Now, there's a, there's a grace period, I believe, that alcoholics uh, get exposed to one way or the other. And the grace period is basically a period of sobriety that's granted to us of differing lengths of time until we learn what we need to do to recover and learn and until we learn what we need to do to rightly relate ourselves to our higher power. So I didn't learn this in the meetings I was going to. I learned it from a series of tapes. I became a tape junkie. Anybody in here ever become obsessed with something? And if two is good, 200 is better. Well, that was me. I, uh, the first series of tapes I got was, uh, was, uh, Joe and Charlie. I, I quickly found a, a Joe Hawk workshop from, uh, from Santa Monica that I latched into very, very seriously. Then I started, I, then I got the catalogs and I got the Encore catalog from California. I discovered Glenn Kay. Uh, you know, and I started buying tapes and I started to d- develop an understanding of the recovery process from them because this just was not the topic at the meetings that I was going to. Normally at a, at a step meeting, here's what would happen. People would go around the room and uh, share on the step, uh, philosophize about the step, uh, talk about the step, read about the step, think about the step, uh, go to a meeting about the step, but not do the step. And so I wasn't hearing a lot of experience. I was hearing a lot of opinions and I was hearing a lot of uh, – uh, personal philosophy on the steps at these step meetings. So I was very confused about the recovery process. Anyway, uh, I have got to tell you that tapes saved my life. The, there was no one in my area when I, when I uh, learned about recovery who was in recovery. There just wasn't. Uh, and, and I got it from tapes. So if you are new, if you're coming back, if you're a relapser, latch in. If you want recommendations for tapes in the back, come up to me. I, I can rec- I, I know at least three quarters of what's back there and has, have listened to it. So anyway, um, I start listening to these tapes and they're, they're teaching me about, uh, about powerlessness. They're teaching me about unmanageability. They're telling me, Chris, if you're restless, irritable, and discontented, if you have self-centered fear, if you if you hold on to resentments maybe a little longer than you should. Anybody in here hold on to resentments a little longer than they should? Welcome. You, you know what I mean? I had this list of people I had yet to get even with. You know, I'd wait 12 years. I get you. I wasn't letting go of anything, you know? I am going to even the score. I mean, that's I was I was a resentment machine. Uh you know, it, 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 talks, it talks about uh, uh, all kinds of emotional turmoil that we have in our lives. Spiritual malady, they call it. And that's what it is. That's an inability to rightly re- relate ourselves to ourselves, to others, and to God and God's universe. We don't have the ability to rightly relate ourselves. To, we don't harmonize well with others. You know what I mean? If you're new and you think that you know, your boss is a jerk and your family doesn't understand you and you know you you suffer you you, you just a, a endless series of bad breaks and misunderstandings have have followed you around and you know it's just like bad luck and your intentions are good and, and if they'd only judge you on, on your intentions everything would be fine. I mean, it, you know, if you if you have any of that in your consciousness, understand that you are so welcome here. That's that's like. <laughs> That is, uh, that's the membership requirement to be screwed up in the head like that. You know, I mean, you're, you're not supposed to really think alcohol is the problem when you come in here. You're supposed to think you're different and unique because, my God, you, you can be a dirtbag, but you can't be a run of the mill dirtbag. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and that's us. So, uh, 
So here I am. I've got I've got an obsession of the mind. I've got an allergy to the body, and my life is unmanageable externally, internally. I'm not I'm not happy. That's the first step. Uh, that's like uh, it's Custer's last stand. There's more Indians coming. Uh, you know, it's not good news. You don't come out of the first step going, "Oh boy, I finally got it." <laughs> you know, that's not. That's not what we're looking for with first step uh, uh, recognition. And it says we have to fully concede to our innermost selves uh, that we were alcoholic. And that full concession is the understanding that you're doomed. And then we move into step two and, well, maybe not. Maybe there is, uh, maybe there is a power greater than yourselves that can restore you to sanity. Now, how, how I really fully fully integrated with step two. Step two is another bear because most of us coming in here don't really have a he's my pal relationship with God. I mean, if God was omnipotent, then he knew every single bit about all the crap that I was doing and the stupid situations and the, and the DWIs and my family leaving. He was, in, he, was, he, was, he was complicit in that stuff if there's an omnipotent God. You know what I mean? He's like some kind of cosmic Alan Funt up there looking down and saying, J let's see Chris uh, get really high on quaaludes and uh, pull into the police station to ask for directions, you know? <laughs> hey, hey, St. Peter, watch this, uh, you know? I mean, if there's a God, that's what's happening. So, uh, so I, I, don't really have, I don't really have a great relationship with God. So, you know, well, God could and would if he were sought. Seek him now with the desperation of a drowning man. That's not like, oh boy, <laughs> we're uh, we're used to taking pills or going to therapy and talking to somebody about it or or you know, you know, there's or jogging or yeah. I mean, there's like, uh, we're, uh, God, how how in the world is this gonna work? You know what I mean? Uh, uh, and when I got sober, uh, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker were on TV and Jimmy <laughs> Jimmy Schwaggered, and I'm thinking, man, if this is God's front line. <laughs> Man, the joke is on me. You know, thank God I didn't buy one of those uh, heavenly condos or whatever that were for sale. You know, everybody got ripped off. Anyway, um, and uh, and and Jimmy Swagger telling me I'm a sinner and then getting caught in the motel with the hooker was it? That was a that wasn't a highlight of my uh, my conception of uh, the God and the religious community either. So you know you know how we can be. Uh, we're we're we never judge. You know? <laughs> so uh, so here I'm 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 being exposed to the second step, which is you know come to believe in a power greater than the, the power greater than myself can restore me. Standing now, here's how here's how I was able to do a buy-in on this because we each have to find a way to do a buy-in on this. I mean, some of us are just so beaten up. We'll just say okay. You know, God, fine, no problem. Where do I start? I unfortunately was burned with a mind. You know what I mean? And I outthought everything. And, you know, I, I, I would be the guy going down on the Titanic looking for the guy who was in charge of watching for icebergs, you know? And I'm not getting off till I find that jerk who was supposed to be preventing this. You know, I mean, I'm like that. And, uh, so, uh, so I'm going to outthink everything. So I get a hold, I get a hold of a, a set of tapes. Uh, they were, they were from Dick B. And, uh, that led me into some Oxford group studies. And here's what I learned in the Oxford group. In the Oxford group, uh, which is where Alcoholics Anonymous got a, a large proportion of their, their spiritual principles and spiritual exercises. Uh, in the Oxford group, uh, they basically, um, they basically brought you in. And um, under their care and direction, you would, uh, you would uh, have a spiritual awakening of sorts. Now, wh you know, wh what I learned was from the Oxford group was they were more interested in what you did than in your philosophy. Because I, I, I want to read the wordy books. You know, if you want me to relate myself to God, I, I need to go to Drew Seminary School. Because, you know, I, I, so, 
So that would be the wrong way for me to approach this. Like Peter and I were talking about last night, this is experiential. It's not intellectual. It's, you know, uh, f- philosophies and, and things like that are wonderful, but they're not sufficient for us to engage in the recovery process. Uh, action is required. And in the Oxford group, they used to have this thing uh, called uh, just do it. And if you didn't believe in God, they would tell you to pray even though you don't believe, pray, pray, you know, like there is one. Um, and we want you to do this and we want you to do this and we want you to do this. And they were and these books were talking about after you went through these exercises, the majority of people would have a religious conversion experience. They would all of a sudden be in tuned with a power that they called God. They, they would, they would all of a sudden, uh, have extra strength that they didn't even know where it came from. And they would be able to start altering and changing their lives. Now, the Oxford group, um, were more interested in sinners and fallen people. Sure, alcoholics would stumble in there. There's many people that got sober before Bill Wilson and AA in the Oxford group. They've even written books about it. I was a pagan and the big bender or two of them. Uh, of written by people prior to the big book uh, of people who got sober uh, around the early 30s in the Oxford group. Now, but the Oxford group wasn't going to specialize in alcoholics. They were just too messy. You know what I mean? They'd come in really drunk and they'd, they'd, uh, they'd uh, 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 interrupt the meetings, the Oxford group meetings, by wanting to witness. You know, they, Bill Wilson did this. He'd stagger up to the podium at, at the Oxford group meetings and witness in a blackout. And the next day they'd say, they'd say, Bill, man, you were on fire last night. Really what I say. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, they were, they were involved in action and they would have you do things. And I, I'm, I'm serious about this. They had a soapbox and they would take you out in the street corner and they'd put you on the soapbox and you would witness, you would witness your conversion experience. You would talk about Jesus and you'd do whatever. And, uh, this was, this was, uh, the more involvement you had in this, the, the greater the chance that you were going to have the religious conversion experience or the, or what we call the spiritual awakening. So I learned this and I started to recognize the fact that it's about the action. It's about the action. There is a power that greater than myself that can restore me to, to, to sanity, but I can't just wish it. I can't just pray for it. I have to engage in a recovery process. I have to get active. I've got to do some work. I've got my work that I need to do. God or my higher power has his work over here that he has to do. And I have to understand that and get busy. So um, I heard a lot of the one-liners in AA, uh, you know, uh, let go and let God. And I, I would be just like, what? What? How, let go and let God? God doesn't sign checks. You know what I mean? God doesn't go to motor vehicle and get licenses back. How do, how do I, you know, how do I let go and let God? I, I could not, I could not internalize that. I, a lot of the slogans I just had to abandon because I just couldn't understand them. Uh, you know, I don't know why. I think, I think the slogans are, are wonderful when you're, you're so mocus and so new that you can only think one thought at a time. Um, but, uh, but they're dangerous for, for somebody like me because I'll, I'll interpret them how I wish to, inter- I'll interpret easy does it as one meeting a month. You, you know what I mean? I'll interpret, keep it simple as just do one resentment on my resentment inventory. I mean, you know, I, I, so I heard a lot of the one liners, but they didn't help me get a thorough understanding of my participation my, the necessary participation in aligning myself with God, enlisting God's aid, uh, turning my will and my life over to the care of God. I, I didn't understand how to do that until I was exposed to, uh, to the Oxford group process. And that was just, that was just me. And thank God I was a tape junkie at that time. Um, so I started to believe that it's in my actions. And I started to believe that my philosophy was only secondarily important. And I started to get busy 
uh, with the recovery process. Now, these tapes led me to believe that there was, like I, um, like I said last night, these tapes led me to believe that there was a recovery process inside of Alcoholics Anonymous, the fellowship of the spirit as opposed to the spirit of the fellowship. So uh, I, start, I started to get busy uh, with this. And I started to uh, to listen to the tapes and, and uh, try to figure out the mechanics of these steps. Now, in step three, uh, in step three, I really learned about step three from a couple of uh, a couple of workshops that were very very influential uh, for me. Because when you see the steps up on the wall, again, just like the slogans, they really are subject to interpretation. Uh, I remember when I was in rehab, there was a guy on an exercise bicycle going through the steps and he was, and he was going, okay, got four. Okay. Got five. While he was doing his, his half an hour exercise, he was going through the steps like that. Now, you know, he was clicking them off like miles on the bike. Um, it really, really helps to have, some type of a guide. You know, today, uh, I think everybody's pretty lucky. There are, there's, there really are a lot of people with, um, extensive experience in recovery around Alcoholics Anonymous today. Um, more and more groups are starting up. Um, I, I have to say this. Um, when, when the Bernersville group, uh, there's a number of us who, who've started groups. Uh, P- Peter started the one in Union. Uh, I started the one in, in Bernersville. Uh, our friend Howard G started the one in Berkeley Heights. And all of these groups had an el- educational element involved. People that were actually sharing their experience, strength, and hope on the recovery dynamics inside of Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't about war stories. These meetings were not about war stories. They were not about sharing about your anger. I want to talk about anger tonight. Does anybody have a topic? Yeah, I want to talk about anger. And everybody talks about how they're angry. And you walk out of there going, I paid a dollar for that? You know, I could have watched Jerry Springer, you know? I mean, so so anyway... the pockets of enthusiasm have, have started in our area. And this was like unheard of back 10 years ago when some of these groups were starting. It was like we were heretical. We were the heretical branch of Alcoholics Anonymous where the Orthodox branch of AA were where you could go to share about your anger. And all of a sudden, upstarts like us came along and started to, to start recovery meetings, meetings that focused on recovery. And we were heretical. You know, like there were people there's to this day, people warn people away from us. Now, every once in a while, I get the last laugh because if you're a relapser in one of those groups, they finally said you to us <laughs> twice, twice in, in the past month. People have come up and said, you know, Chris, I was taught you were the Antichrist of AA. And, you know, uh, they, I can't you know, I can't believe it because. This this one guy, our, our, I can break his anonymity because he, he's not here. Um, <laughs> his uh, his name is Rainey, and uh, you know uh, Peter knows him. a lot of us know Rainey. He's a, he's gr- uh, he just got incredibly good uh, recovery, and he was going to some of these meetings where he was told to stay away from the Bernardsville group, and he kept relapsing and relapsing and relapsing. Finally, somebody pulls him aside and goes, "Listen, you know." That that group over there in Burnsville, they did they did some real wonders with some guys that were just absolutely hopeless. You know, maybe you should go over there. And he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. You guys have been telling me to stay away from them for like two years. Now you can't help me, and they can. What's the deal? And uh, and he and he he, he, started, he started coming to Burnsville and some of the other groups. And you know, we get the last laugh. Uh, and I'll tell you what, the people that don't need to, to be in Bernersville and don't need to be in Union and don't need to be in Berkeley Heights, that, that, you know, great. Absolutely great. But, but at least there's Union, Berkeley Heights, and Bernersville for the people that, that really need it. Um, anyway, um, coming to terms with the third step, I, under, I understand the book to be directing me toward a couple of things. First of all, I need to stop playing God. Now, you can understand that at different degrees of intensity. Uh, stop playing God uh, can mean different things to different people. 
one of the best ways I ever heard it explained was on a series of tapes by Chuck C. He said that when he made amends to his family, he went up to every single one of them, and this is what he said. He goes, I will never, ever, I promise you right now, I will never, ever, ever ask you to do anything or expect you to do anything ever again except for one thing. If I can ever do anything for you, I want you to please, please ask me to do it. Now, that right there was a beautiful example of how not to play God. Can you imagine not ever expecting or asking asking your loved ones for anything ever again? I don't know. I can do that for 15 minutes. Mary Beth, get me a, get me a water. Yeah, I, you know, it's just, I, that's, that's an ideal. That's an ideal for me. Um, to try not, to try to not play God. Uh, Another thing that the third step is, is pointing me toward is a relationship with, with God, developing relationship qualities with God. And again, the wonderful thing about the book Alcoholics Anonymous, it, listen, it was passed in front of religious people, uh, you know, psychologists. There's nothing in there that should offend anybody. If, it, if, if, if anything in the book uh, pointing you toward God offends you, uh, I would really be surprised. You, you've got you, you're a member of a religion I don't understand. Uh, but basically, the the relationship directives are this: you are to be uh, the child, and God is to be the parent. You are to be the agent, and God is to be the principal. You are to be the directed, and God is to be your director. Now, how actually does that happen? You gotta understand, we're only making a decision in step three. We're making a decision in step three to do this. Uh, I don't know anybody that can fully turn their will and their lives over to the care of God as they understand Him. Uh, history has shown that people that have that ability usually don't last long. You know what I mean? So, uh, so, and, and, and being, being human and being fallible and, and, uh, falling short, uh, every day in word, thought, and deed, I know that I cannot uh, maintain that, um, that, uh, that, uh, ideal. I just, I can't, but I can make attempts. I can participate in those relationships. Um, how do, how does, uh, how does God, uh, be the father? Um, think about the role of a parent. Uh, you, you know, you, you, uh, you give birth to a child, you nurture them and, uh, and teach them as they mature. And that's kind of, what I see God's role as. How is a God, the, how is God the principal and how am I the agent? Well, think about the relationship between, uh, a life insurance salesman and the main office, say. Um, you're sent out to do the, the work. And as long as you operate within the guidelines of the home office, everything is going to work out fine for you. You have the backing of the home office. If, uh, if someone needs, if someone, you know, dies and you, you, they'll, they'll get paid by the home office because you did everything right and they did everything right. So again, if I live according to spiritual principles, spiritual living is my answer. Alcoholism is my problem. Spiritual living is my answer. If I try to live, if I attempt to live along spiritual lines, I'm buying into that. Uh, I'm, I'm making an attempt, um, to have God as the principal and, and myself as the agent and director and directed. That's pretty simple. Uh, we seek through prayer and meditation to, uh, 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 to, to seek God's will, uh, through prayer and meditation. So, uh, we try to develop that intuitive capacity within ourselves. Uh, you know, we're, we were born with it. You know, right from wrong. Uh, too often do we choose wrong today? You become kind of, uh, spiritually fragile the longer you stay sober and the longer you practice this program. And what I mean by that is you pay a greater penalty for violating spiritual principles the longer you've been working spiritual principles. You know, if, if I was to lie in at work today, it would be like on the front page of the, the newspaper. I mean, you know, I, I used to live by the lie. If I said one today, I, I probably would get caught. You know, we're, we're, we're more subject to, uh, uh, to paying a penalty for our failure to follow uh, spiritual principles. Uh, but today, um, 
today I do try to follow that intuitive capacity within me that tells me right from wrong. Every once in a while I override it and I say, no, nope, I'm doing it this way. And almost invariably it, things end up bad because I'm telling you, we have an intuitive capacity uh, uh, to do the right thing. We just do. It's, it's God-given. And if we rightly relate ourselves to it and we develop that capacity, it can become very, very strong. And it can guide us into unbelievably wonderful things. Um, you know, so how is, um, you know, how does this, how does this work in, in my life today? I, um, I've changed the way I live. Uh, I've changed many, many things about how I, uh, how I operate in the world. Um, and I can only do that with God's help. Because uh, it even says we don't have the power to live along spiritual lines without God's help. So uh, a lot of prayer, a lot of meditation, and uh, uh, a lot of meetings, a lot of working with others, a, a lot of step work. And uh, I think that's, that's really what I need to do today. Because I got to tell you, it's not just about being sober for me today. I I I don't want to just be sober. I know what that's like. I've had periods of sobriety. I know uh, the mental, uh, spiritual, and emotional deterioration that takes place when I just stay sober. I don't want to participate that any in, in in that anymore. And you know, if you're new and you're and you're thinking, man, he's you know he's talking about this long and drawn out you know life system. I'm going to have to change all my friends. And all. You know, it it really it really is uh, something that happens over the course of time. Um, and all the changes are positive. Uh, I used to think if I have a spiritual awakening, I won't be my unique self, my special unique self. <laughs> like, well, that's a good thing. If, it, you know, if you're thinking that, because uh, yeah, you may be special, but, uh, uh, you know, go around and ask people just how special and they might tell you. So, um, you know, so anyway, um, I believe that the spiritual life is not a theory. I believe that we have to live it. I think the the first step is telling us we're dead if we don't. The second step is telling us we uh, we may live uh, to very useful purpose if we do. The third step is telling us, you know, are you in or are you out? Do you want this thing? Uh, do you want this thing? Or do you want to throw the book out the window like the original manuscript said and try it on your own for a while? You know, we're stubborn people. We're very, very stubborn people. We uh, we sometimes make that decision to try it our own way, and it says sometimes we pay the ultimate price for that stubbornness. Um, I've just found I've just found not only the easier, softer way, the uh, the way that that is just transformative, and uh, the way with that my quality of life just increases uh, every year is is the way of. Uh, of living spiritually, you know, so I'm, uh, I'm very, very glad that I was exposed to this in the way uh, I've been exposed to it. Absolutely marvelous. Just wonderful stuff. This is what it's all about, my friends. Uh, please, if you have a chance, uh, drop us an email here at take12radio at comcast.net. Don't forget our recovery caption, uh, cartoon caption contest. Go to Take12Radio.com, click on Recovery Cartoons, enter the contest. You could win $1,000 worth of recovery goodies uh, by Christmas time. And uh, you might just win uh, our monthly prize, which is a... Uh, uh, great recovery comedy DVD uh, by Mark Lundholm, recovery comedian. Hey, until our next broadcast, this is the Monty Man, and I'm wishing God's perfect serenity for you. Bye bye now. Without the booze, I've been living, that's a fact. Without the booze, I've been making my way back. Without the booze, Let it go and stay out of my own way. Stay out of my own way. Stay out of my own way. 
stay out of my own way. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting.